Not all change is good. Not all change is bad. And not all change is important. There are basically two kinds of change that are important. One is the fact that we tend to look for happiness in things that are going to change, hoping that they'll last, hoping that they'll be reliable. And again and again and again we're disappointed, like the person who kept eating peppers, hoping to find a sweet one one day. And that kind of change is the change you have to accept. so you can go beyond it. The other kind of change that's really important is the fact your mind is so changeable. As the Buddha once said, it's so quick to change that even he couldn't think of a good analogy for how quick it was. Here he was, the master of analogies. The twinkling of an eye is still slower than the, the mind when it's ready to change. And that's the kind of change you have to fight. The first change is a matter of developing discernment. The second change is a matter of developing mindfulness. You hear again and again the Ajahns in Thailand talking about the essential factors of the path are mindfulness and discernment. The two words satipanya go together in Thai. In fact, when you put the two together, mindfulness and discernment, it equals intelligence. And that's what intelligence is. It's not trying to see all change is good or all change is bad or is all change is something to be accepted, you're discerning, and you figure out how to deal properly with whatever change comes your way, with the things that the, the mind tends to try to find happiness in. That's when you have to develop discernment around the three perceptions to see where these things are in constant. And the fact that they're in constant means that they're stressful. You can't really find a lasting happiness there. And if something is inconstant and stressful, why is it worth calling yourself? Why is it worth identifying with? These are tools for peeling away your attachments to things that change in that way. But what are you going to do? You keep pulling away your attachments where you left. Well, that's where the other approach comes in. And the Buddha talks about the duty of mindfulness is not just to watch things arise and pass away, it's actually to actively give rise to things that are skillful and to help unskillful things pass away more quickly. This is what you've got to remember. But mindfulness is all about the things you keep in mind as you try to develop skillful qualities. So if something skillful comes to the mind, you don't just simply watch it come and go and say, well, that changes. You do your best to make it arise, and when it's there, you do your best to keep it coming, keep it in place. As for unskillful things, you do your best to get rid of them. And once you're rid of them, you want to make sure they don't come back. And it's by attacking this second kind of change, the change of the changeability of the mind, that you actually give yourself the strength you need in order to do the first kind of analysis with, analysis with your discernment. <clears throat> because you've got to develop the strengths of the mind. basically five. And these are the things you want to work on, bringing into being. So when you feel weak, you have something to fall back on. When the mind feels very susceptible to change, to give up in its pursuit of what's really good for it, you've got to remind yourself you've got things that you can fall back on. At the very least, you've got conviction that the Buddha was right that human beings can do this, can put an end to suffering. And then it's a really worthwhile project. So even if it goes more slowly than you would hope, you can't say, well, I'll just give up on this for the time being and pursue something else, because this will constantly be nagging away at the back of the mind. 
You've got to have conviction that okay, the Buddha could do it. He was a human being. He could do it. You're a human being. You can do it too. And that was the attitude he had you take. Even though he said that was a form of conceit, it's useful conceit. Because what you're doing here is you're developing these strengths. You're taking things that are impermanent, but you're making use of them. In Ananda's image, when he's talking to the Buddha one time, he said the Buddha teaches how to go across the river by going from one dependence to another. In other words, you can't just fly across the river. You've got to step here, step there on the rock that's here, rock that's there. And the rocks may be a little bit unstable, but they're stable enough for you to walk across the river on. That's what you've got to depend on. And so from that conviction comes persistence. You stick with it. And you use whatever tool comes to hand. A true warrior is not very picky about his, his weapons. He tries to have the best weapons possible, but there are times when unexpected things can show their power. There was a movie years back called Willow. It was a big flop here in the States, but it was a wild, wild success <coughs> in Asia. And I told the story of a cheap village magician who had one little trick, and it was a pretty cheap trick. That's how he made his living. Then he gets swept up in this big battle between sorcerers and sorceresses. And at the very end, he's facing off the, the, the ultimate enemy. And it turns out that that cheap little trick he played to, to fool the, the other peasants actually worked against the super sorcerer. So you have to remember, whatever trick works in keeping the mind here in the present moment, keeping it from slipping into unskillful qualities, whether it's a sophisticated trick or an unsophisticated one, you have to worry. If it works, it works. And sometimes when your defilements get really sophisticated, the kind of the blunt instrument is a good way to deal with them. So you stick with it. You keep at the practice regardless. And having that kind of momentum that whatever comes up, I'm going to deal with it the best I can. It may be kind of scrappy and you may not succeed every time. But at least having that attitude, the first attitude is if it's unskillful, fight it. If it's skillful, encourage it. This is what you've got to keep in mind. This is where mindfulness becomes a strength. That you remember, you may, the mind may say, well, you're going to give in anyhow, so why don't you give in now? Make it easy for us. You've got to remember, okay, you've fallen for that many, many times before. And what you're responsible for right now is right now. And what you're going to do five minutes down the line, you say, well, we'll deal with that five minutes down the line, but right now we're fighting. And if you keep on having that attitude right now, right now, right now, you get, it gets you past the five minutes. And gradually, as your mindfulness gets stronger and more consistent, okay, this is when you get to develop the strength of concentration. We're talking today about the, the strength of the breath. Well, what makes the breath strong is your focus. The focus strengthens the breath, and then as the breath gets more consistently comfortable, then it gets easier to stay focused. I mean, the two qualities help each other along, but the preliminary strength comes from your, your concentration. So remember, it's the strength of mind that matters the most, much more than the strength of the body. Because after all, the body is one of those things we think we're going to be able to stay with, and no matter how much we know that we're going to die, we have this attitude, well, this body is going to be different. And it's not. And it can surprise you how it comes up with diseases you wouldn't have thought possible. So that's at times like that that you need strength of mind, that regardless of what the body does, you're not going to be phased. You're going to keep doing your best. Years back, there was a woman suffering from cancer. I went to stay with the John Mahabua for a couple months, together with her friend, who was an old retired doctor. And the John Mahabua gave a long series every evening of Dharma talks. Finally, the woman back, went back home, ultimately died. And her friend, the doctor, was still around. And she got the tapes that the woman had made. She had recorded every one of the talks. 
And so the old doctor, even though her eyesight was going, tried to see, can I transcribe all the tapes? And she did. And she said she took encouragement from Ajahn Mahabhava's comment that as your body gets older, you want to see what good you can still squeeze out of it. So even though she was past 80, she transcribed two enormous Dharma books. So even though was, uh, the process was slower than, say, getting a professional or someone who was younger, still it meant a lot to her that she could still do it. Well, you've got to have that attitude. You squeeze what you can out, out of what you've got. And as you keep working with what your tools are, you finally do get into good concentration. Again, whether it's quick or slow, and whether it's how you imagine it might be or not, that doesn't. None of those things matter. What matters is as you ultimately get there. And of course, in doing this, you develop the strength of, of discernment. As you've learned the tricks of the trade, how to get the mind to settle down, how to get the mind to stay there and how to keep your guard up for what is going to come along and destroy your concentration. And ultimately you even begin to see what is it in the concentration that's an unnecessary burden. Because this is a lot of the, the strength of discernment. It's the strength that comes seeing you carrying around too many loads. And you begin to say, oh, this is a load I can let go of. This is another load I can let go of. That's one of the signs of wisdom, is your ability to see which things really are your responsibility and your burden, and you carry them, and which things are not. And as you lighten your load, then even though the strength of the body may be less, still the fact that the load is lighter means, means that you can manage it. So these are the kinds of things that are changeable, but you want to change them in the direction of fighting them if they start slipping away and fighting whatever is going to come in and try to destroy them. This is the duty of mindfulness. But it pulls discernment in, pulls all your other good qualities in as well. So as you look at change in yourself and change around you, remember that certain changes are a lot more important. They have to take priority. The changes where you have to use your discernment to accept the fact that they will change and to learn to release yourself from any attachment to them. And then the change where you fight the change. Mindfulness can slip away so easily. Concentration can slip away so easily, but you're going to fight it and see it through. Develop these things, because after all, that's one of the duties of the Four Noble Truths. All too often people talk about the three characteristics or the three perceptions totally without reference to the Four Noble Truths. I mean, there are duties with the Four Noble Truths, and one of them is that you develop concentration, you develop mindfulness. You don't just watch it come and go. So make sure you keep your duties straight, and you use some intelligence around change. Use your discernment, use your mindfulness. So you can get the good that comes from managing change the proper way. I mean, finally get to something that doesn't change. Those good qualities enable the mind to open up to another dimension that is totally free from change. That's why we work on them. I and mean, they will fall away. After all, they're part of the path. But the goal, once it's attained, does not fall away. The path doesn't cause the goal. It takes you there. And the goal is something else entirely. So we focus on change, learn to be intelligent about change, so we can find a basis for happiness that really is worthwhile, and that's not going to change on us at all. And once you've found that, you can let the rest of the stuff go. Because what you found doesn't need any improvement at all. It's the ultimate happiness, and it won't let you down.